Welcome to the Control the Room podcast, a series devoted to the exploration of meeting culture and uncovering cures for the common meeting. Some meetings have tight control and others are loose. To control the room means achieving outcomes while striking a balance between imposing and removing structure, asserting and distributing power, leaning in and leaning out, all in the service of having a truly magical meeting. Today, I'm with Leslie Ann Noel at NC State University in Raleigh, North Carolina, where she is the Assistant Professor of Design. She's also the author and creator of the Designer's Critical Alphabet. Welcome to the show, Leslie Ann. Thank you, Douglas. How are you? I am well and excited to chat with you. We had such a lovely exchange in the pre-show chat. I'm really looking forward to having this conversation. I am too. <laughs> I'm excited. <laughs> To kick things off, I'd like to hear a little bit about how you got started. How do you become a professor of design? We don't have enough time for me to tell you where I got my start. Um, Because, you know, like some people might say, oh, I migrated into this profession later on in my my career or something like that. But I've actually been in design since middle school. And uh, I'm (laughs) I'm almost, uh, I don't know, it's middle school was a long time ago, actually, right? So it's um, so you could say I've been in this for most of my life. Um, I'm from Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean, and in that education system, we specialize really early. Uh, so from middle school, I said, okay, yes, I'm interested in art and design, and I chose it then at eight th- aged thirteen as a subject area that I was interested in and I just continued and I've morphed through many different areas of design, graphic design, textile design, product design and then even like more unconventional things like designing sets for shows or designing costumes or you know for carnival. Um, So it's hard for me to say what where I got my start. I am trained as an industrial designer And that start is like really, again, kind of, so that one is like really casual where I was looking through a magazine and I saw this glass um, vase and I just thought, oh my gosh, this vase is so beautiful. And the magazine that I was looking at was a prospectus for a university. Um, This is how long ago this was, you know, where you had to write to a university and ask them for a magazine and they'd send you this magazine and you would then try to figure out what you wanted to study from the magazine that they sent you. And so this glass vase in this magazine, a glossy magazine from a university in New York, made me move from graphic design and textile design into industrial design. Um, but I guess I've just been here <laughs> in this space since for so long that it's almost like, what other space would I be in? You know, my entire life is about design. You know, it struck me when you were talking about making that shift into industrial design, that you were coming from a a deep background with experience in other types of design. I wonder how these different perspectives or approaching design from different disciplines has impacted the way you think about design as a whole. So it has had a big impact because since I've moved through so many different areas of design, I can really see where the process is the same across the different disciplines. So actually today, I work in a kind of non-specialist area of design, and I have been in this kind of non-specialist area of design for a while, where you know people ask me, okay, what kind of designer are you? And I no longer use an adjective um, Mm. because I'm really just seeing it as a kind of process that we are applying to anything. And so I guess um, with some hubris (laughs) or overconfidence, I feel like I can design anything, which is probably not something I should say on a on a on a podcast. But, you know, because um, in, in industrial design, you change the materials that you're working with on each project. So it's actually a different way that we have to think about things in industrial design because you learn new, um, you learn about new materials and processes for the project that you're working on and then you discard that information 
and you learn about something new the, the next time around. So it, it just means that I, I think about design possibly in um, an abstract way as this process that we're then applying to many different things. So it, it's, I, I think about the process that we use as well as the creative approaches that we use, um, that we div we start to use a little bit intuitively as designers. You know, through practice, we then become very comfortable with. Um, I mean, to use some of the cliche stuff with getting with fast failure, and um, we we get comfortable with knowing that we have to repeat an idea fifty times before we come up with something innovative. So I think uh, there are ways that designers think across all of the design disciplines. And that's where I am today. So I, I found it really interesting because you referred to it as non-specialist design, which I think is like pretty descriptive of this territory. There's certainly designers that are, and also entrepreneurs that are like, I need to hire a designer. <laughs> and like clearly they're thinking graphic designer or or product designer, or you know, there's specialties and you learn that craft and you can do that thing. But there's definitely this bigger umbrella of how you approach challenges and problems and how you solve things. And I love this idea of non-specialist design. I haven't had a great way of referring to it in the past, but the thing I would challenge there, don't you have to deeply specialize or do a lot of specialization to get to that point where, where you're like a non-specialist? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> and, and maybe, actually, I mean, I'm saying I'm a non-specialist, but maybe actually I'm a specialist in a field that's unnamed, <laughs> right? Yeah, um, yeah. Because I used to be attracted to the area of design that's called design management, you know, because, you know, like as designers, if you're working with a lot of different people, there, there's sometimes a lot of different moving parts to get a product made. And so I used to find myself starting to gravitate. I've been in academia for a little while, so I was starting to gravitate towards the, the kind of design management conferences because I thought, well, okay, maybe that's where I am because I do understand design as strategy and design as more of like a management kind of space. And so currently, I guess today you could say I'm in design thinking and it is a space that I inhabit fairly comfortably and knowing that it's also a space that you know a lot of people love and a lot of people hate right but um what i like about this space of design thinking is that i can then focus on the area that i'm interested in which is thinking you know in my phd work i spend a lot of time writing about how we think as designers and I, and you know even before doing my phd I was kind of dabbling, you know, when I was still teaching in Trinidad at the University of the West Indies, I was already looking at um, maybe creative cognition, which is about thinking. So, you know, I was, design thinking became a place where I could be, even though the way that I talk about design thinking is sometimes different to the way that um, people talk about design thinking in more, maybe more corporate spaces. Mm. And how would you articulate that difference? So there are like different bodies of literature around design thinking. And I've identified maybe about three. And actually, I haven't identified it. There's a paper by somebody called Lucy Kimball that talks about three bodies of literature around design thinking. And uh, as someone coming from a design background... I then start in one area where I'm looking at um, the way we think as designers, the way we approach problems, the way we work together, you know, the kinds of methods that we use as designers and ways of thinking and ways of being, right? And then the second body of literature is around um, wicked problems. And maybe this is a space, it's, it's like... Maybe using design to address complexity. And, and maybe it's a space where more non-designers start to come in because we might be looking mm -hmm. at social problems in, in this body of literature. And, and then the third body of literature, which is where I think most of the people talking about design thinking are, is like design thinking as this organizational resource or organizational tool to transform 
maybe business processes, maybe the design of services, but it's really then focused on kind of corporate innovation. And uh, um, so the difference is that whereas many people in design thinking might be really just looking at that third area because they are focused on that type of innovation, I'm coming from art and design, so I'm using that original body of literature and then I'm also working in social impact. And so I'm also using the wicked problems literature. So <laughs> I'm, I'm conveniently using the term in a few different ways to support the work that I do. I was about to bring up the social impact work that you were doing at Tulane and really curious to hear how that's continued and into the work you're doing today. And I'm just really fascinated about, you know, using these tools to not only think about business value, but to just think about social value as well. Yeah, so being at Tulane was a really good experience because I had accountability in my title. <laughs> you know, um, I was Associate Director of Design Thinking for Social Impact. And our center name, Phyllis M. Taylor Center for Social Innovation and Design Thinking, also had some accountability in the name. And so it was a good space to be because it meant then as I created programs, you know, as, as a program director, as I created programs, I had to think about, okay, where is the impact or where's the social part of it, with social justice, or, you know, um, am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing as I made these programs? And so I, I, I don't have to say I created a course. I inherited a course called Design Thinking for Collective Impact, but how I created that, that course is, or how I designed it, is we focus then on the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. And uh, every semester we selected one SDG. Well, I see, generally I selected one SDG, but actually in the middle of the pandemic in that summer of 2020, something interesting happened where uh, two people from New Orleans reached out to me and said, okay, we know now what your class is about. And we are going to tell you what SDG you should focus on. And I thought, okay, this is actually where we want to be, right? Because we're talking about social impact. We're talking about community engaged work. If the community is telling us what the class should be about, then yeah, this is, this is a pretty good space. So what happened then is that the SDG that they were interested in was good health and well-being because they said, okay, you know, with the pandemic, this is what we have to focus on. And so that shifted then my class, where my class really started to focus on good health and well-being. So for one semester, we, we interviewed people in New Orleans to understand good health and well-being, and then went through um, a typical kind of design cycle, but only focused on what we were hearing people talking about that they needed related to good health and well-being. And then the semester after that, we focused on um, Feeding Louisiana, which is a food bank, um, the food bank program in Louisiana. They reached out to us and we were able to continue that work around good health and well-being, but now with a more specific or a more focused frame where we were thinking about people's access to good food through Feeding Louisiana. And so... The entire class became about, let's say, designing better access based on what people were telling us that they needed, right? We, I'll tell you a little bit more about some of the other programs from um, that time at Tulane that I was really kind of happy with. We used to do a program called Design Thinking Gumbo, where, which... Um, it's gumbo, so we're able to bring in uh, <laughs> New Orleans local culture. And actually, maybe even before I describe it, I should say the general philosophy around the programs that I was creating was about how to make this stuff accessible, okay? How to make this information about design, 
or design thinking seem like people, ah, to continue the food metaphor, seem like this was yummy stuff, right? That, you know, how to make it palatable to people. And so design thinking gumbo became about getting people to broaden what they thought of as design thinking. And so we just introduced people and, and we were aiming to introduce people in New Orleans in general, uh, but this happened during the pandemic, so we did it remotely online. But we wanted to introduce people to like different ways of doing design research and then show them, well, okay, hey, you could use this kind of research tool in the public health research that you're doing. Even though it's a design tool, you can use it, right? And then actually out of that, I started to collaborate with a professor um, at Tulane, Alessandra Bassano, where we started to actually take design research tools and work with people in New Orleans to see, could we get public health researchers to understand how to do design research or to use the way that we think visually and creatively in design to collect data in, in their research that we, they were doing. And so like all of this is, I was always interested in, in social justice. I've always been interested in social justice my entire life, right? Uh, and being in New Orleans and being at Tulane changed my work because I was very responsive to people in New Orleans, even though I really didn't spend a long time in New Orleans. And then because Tulane it was, is so focused on public health, then I started to do a lot of work in public health. And so how that has impacted the work at NC State is that I am now working on um, a course called, it doesn't have a real name yet, but it's like designing equitable futures, where I'm drawing on this other interest that I have, right, which is the future. And, and so it's designing equitable futures through a lens of gender, accessibility, and race. I love this. So I'm able to take these three things that I'm very interested in, push people far out into the future and say, well, okay, how do we design? How do we learn to see where there are problems in society? So continuing the social impact work from that I would have started at Tulane. How can we see where there are problems in society and then kind of maybe get a little creative with the solutions because sometimes we are not creative. That's, you know, yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, so is it safe to say that this is speculative design focused on uh, social justice? Yes, that's a good, that's a good way of saying it. Um, and I, I should acknowledge that I'm joining a tribe of other people who have been also doing this work before me. So um, I'll drop a few names. None of them know that I'm going to drop their yeah. name. <laughs> so like John Jennings, um, he's a professor in California, and he illustrated, there's an illustrated version of um, Parable of the Sower, and he was involved in that project. But he, his class is about critical race theory. And, um, mm. oh my goodness, he might send me an email and say, no, that's not what the class is about. But, <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> critical race theory and futurism and design. And so I've, I've been inspired by his class. Roger Shah, who's at Drexel University, has a class about climate and um, utopia and, you know, designing these new futures. There's another Californian professor. He's from the North Bay area now, Avi Lonnie Brooks. And he, is, he has a game called Afro Rhythms of the Future where he's using Afrofuturism to um, have people co-design new futures. So, you know, like now that I have the space to create this new class, that's what I'm, you know, I'm like, okay, I want to build off what everybody has been doing and, you know, join this movement of people who are saying, you know what, let's create these new futures um, that are much more diverse because that's, that's the thing about, um, you know, sometimes when people are talking about this, you know, the future and speculative futures and stuff like that, they're really not representing diverse issues. Mm. There's one futurist 
who, whose name I won't drop <laughs> because I'm going to be a little critical of his work, right? So, like, he's, like, really, really famous. And I went to his presentation once, and I was excited to go because I, I respect his work so much. And then during the workshop, I just thought why is this future so white, <laughs> right? And I mean, mm -hmm. maybe it wasn't, but, you know, I, I wasn't comfortable with the content of his workshop. And I, I was really disappointed because, as I said, this is somebody who I had a lot of respect for. And the person who was sitting next to me was Mexican-American. And we, we spoke about that in the, in the break, you know, like, you're like, this content is actually not bad, but it's it's one story you know it's just and it's a story that excludes us so yeah i'm excited to look at that you know how do we create these just equitable and diverse futures moving forward and and i do some of this type of work in planning workshops like i've been doing um like at tulane and at stanford i fac facilitated um planning workshops for teams, you know, for my team, where I would ask people to imagine a date in the, in the future, and then we'd brainstorm around that through a lens of equity. And uh, in one of those workshops, when I was planning the workshop with the person who was my supervisor, I think I had set a date of like 2072, and the person asked me, well, why are you picking that year? It's so far away, right? And I said, you know, she wanted me to, to choose a year that was 15 years away. I think she wanted like 20. I don't even know if she wanted 15 years. She wanted 20, 30 something. And I told her that's too close. And she's like, why? Because, you know, none of us will be here in 2070. How are we going to get to the change that we want or something like that? And I had to explain to her, look, if we choose a year that's too close, people are going to start to say, well, none of this stuff is possible mm -hmm. because there is this law or that law or, you know, people start to give us all the reasons that things don't have to change or the, all of the things that are preventing change prevent people from dreaming about something different. And I found I have much more su success in getting people to be visionary when we push them really far out into the future. And, you know, like once someone said to me, well, it's not just escapism or, you know, like the person was kind of telling me that um, I, I need to get people into a more realistic space in the, in the future. But I found with the social justice work I've found that I've gotten to people gotten people to be much more visionary and much more creative um, when we push it further out because you know we just think okay by the time we're in 2072 some things really should be unacceptable you know and these things really should not exist anymore and so then we could start to figure out okay how are we going to make sure that these problems don't exist in this 2072 as I was listening to that, it really struck me as, you know, what you're doing by pushing it out really far is just emancipating everyone from the shackles, right? That we, we have either, our, and some of these are just biases that we're not even taking into account. And even if we know about them, it's hard to like just shut them off with the switch. So you're kind of tricking us into shutting them off. But then you could couple that with, okay, now that we decided this, how do we make it happen in 2037? Exactly. That would be a fun shift, right? Because now we're now we're coming back into the realm of, wow, we got to figure this out. This is what we said we're going to do. How are we going to do it? You just crawled into my mind because actually that's what I did for, um, for her workshop where I pushed them out. And I, I like to create scenarios as well when, I, when I'm doing this kind of work. So I pushed them out. I didn't go as far as 2072. I think I went to like 2056 or something like that. I mean, you know, sometimes these years are significant because it might be like somebody's birthday or, you know, somebody's mm -hmm. 100th birthday or something like that, right? So I, I said that they were getting the Nobel Prize in 2056 or what. And then I said, actually our work shifted 
tremendously and I gave them two years. And it was the years that, you know, the administrator really wanted me to focus on, you know. So I said, what did we do in 2030? Actually, I might have even said, what did we do in 2025? And what did we do in 2030 that really got us to, to that place? So, yeah, you crawled into my mind that you saw what I did. <laughs> so, yeah, I love that. And I'm a huge fan of the designer's critical alphabet. And ever since I've gotten it, I love pulling it out from time to time when I'm working on anything. And I think that's the beauty of what you're referring to as um, non-specialist design, because it could be a presentation. It could be a template we're building for a client. And I don't know, it's just fun to kind of pull out, kind of flip through the cards and go, what's going to help me kind of think about things differently or consider something, some negative element of the world that's kind of got me in its grips? And I think the emancipatory research is one that's really, really fascinating to think about. But the one that I come to quite often because it just resonates with me a ton is values. Mm. And it aligns a little bit, too, with some of the conversation we had earlier in the pre-show chat around helping designers think beyond the problem. Like we all often talk about the problem statement or what's the pain point or the problem people have. Mm -hmm. But I think understanding people's values can be quite liberating as far as if you're creating stuff for them yeah all right you brought me to a card I, that i don't look at very often so let me see but <laughs> but you know the thing is i guess i've internalized a lot of the alphabet right and um i i actually do ask people about values very often when i do co-creation workshops you know i say what is it we're trying to create and what are the values that we need to get to the thing or, or what are the values that we need to foster co-creation or so I, I think that values I, I'm looking at my card right now so do you and the people you are designing for have the same value system and how does this affect your approach that's I, I think I've been working with that question for a little bit in different ways because I've been starting to see the many different value systems that we have in play around us. You know, like I listened to a conversation this morning where this woman was talking actively about anti-racism work and then she said... What did she say? She said, oh, I have an MBA from an elite university, and so I'm invested in capitalism. And then when you tell me capitalism is racist, then this really challenges my value system. Or, you know, I mean, this is like, I've been thinking about that, you know, people who have, you know, sometimes we have like, within the same project, we have so many different value systems, whether you are, yes, that flag-waving capitalist whether you are the person who's saying defund police, whether you are even um, not from the space, I'll say, like, you know, if you're non American, if you're coming from a, a completely different worldview, you know, how do you balance all of these values in the same place? And so, you know, a lot of people say that one of my favorite words is pluriversality mm, yeah. because. I think that we do have to acquire the skill of being able to allow people to, to bring their different value systems in and then for us to listen to these different points of view and different value systems and then um, facilitate conversations among people who think differently. You know, I think that that's a real skill um, that some of us have to cultivate as designers to do this work well. Right. The card. So you talked about values, but the card that I like actually is about self-awareness, which is kind of tied to the mm -hmm. values card. But I think that one is like a really important one where, again, we can't see or hear the different values without the self-awareness. Right. Mm -hmm. To know that. Well, to be open enough to listen and then maybe even ask some questions about ourselves and our values. And yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's a card that I, I love the quote at the bottom to become more self-aware. You have to be self-aware 
enough to know how self-aware you are not. Yes. <laughs> somebody, <laughs> somebody sent me something on Twitter and said, why is there a riddle at the end of that cup? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, you know, I, it, I want to come back to that kind of connection between self-awareness and values. And I think there's this interesting thing about values where because they're so personal and have so much emotion entrenched in them, mm-hmm. and, and a lot of times they're deeply rooted. You know, we, these values came up from our upbringing or from mm-hmm. sometimes trauma or just very intense experiences we might have had. And sometimes – one value can overshadow other values that you have and there can be opportunities to connect with people through values that you share, but because of this one value kind of overshadows everything else. And we see that in politics, right? There's a single voter issues, Mm -hmm. but that same phenomenon exists outside of politics as well. And I think if we're designing, being, being really great designers of experiences, we have to recognize that. So I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on that. Yeah, understanding our own value systems and understanding that our values are not the only values. You know, this is part of our work. If if we want to do this work well as designers and we want to meet people's needs, we have to know, well, okay, what are we bringing into this project? Um, I'm going to shift you to another card again. You know, like, so this, this yeah. is like tied to bias, you know, where we have to think mm. about, okay, what are our biases when we come into this project, right? So I might be designing in New Orleans. I'm an outsider from New Orleans, so I'm bringing my outsider values. I might be bringing my own biases into the work that I'm doing. But I need the self-awareness, <laughs> to bring you back to that one, to know that I'm bringing in my values, to understand what other things that I believe, and then to see that, okay, everybody doesn't have to believe these things that I believe, to understand that when I, when I make a statement on something, when I make a design choice, bring in another card, maybe this is a challenge to see how many questions, how many um, sentences can I tie together with cards, right? But (laughs) when I make a design choice, my positionality affects this. You know, my positionality affects my values. It um, creates the biases. It's, so it's like we need to bring all of this into the work that we do as designers, not necessarily um, creating like a hierarchy saying that my values are better than someone else's or my, my worldview is, is more important than someone else's. But, you know, we have to understand that there are just many different ways of knowing and being and we have to create spaces for these conversations to happen and it's tough to navigate all of that it's not an easy process you know like maybe I'm not getting to a resolution but you know it's because it is a long process you know this kind of work that um, around social impact is a long process work around aligning values takes a lot of time a lot of conversation a lot of discussion you know to get us to, to a place that makes sense. You know, as you brought up positionality, it reminded me when I was reading the cards for the first time that um, it brought to mind this notion of the observer phenomenon, which I thought I was really delighted to anytime someone can like connect physics and design for me, it's always an awesome moment. Are you familiar with observer phenomenon? No, I, I know, aren't. Um, but I'm wondering if this is like an ethnography kind of term, because there's a term, um, oh, actually I might be, tell me what it is and I'll tell you if it's what I think it is. <laughs> yeah, so it's a phenomenon in physics where if you literally, the act of observing mm-hmm. changes the behavior. Yes. So the fact that you set up an experiment to look at it means that it's not the same as like, yeah. as when you uh, when you weren't observing it. And I was thinking, that's really fascinating, this notion of positionality, because you observing it, you're putting your position mm-hmm. uh, onto whatever you're observing. And, and so yes. <laughs> I was, yes. that was pretty fascinating. So I actually know that phenomenon from anthropology, right? Where just you being, and it's the same thing, you know, you being inside of the group that's being observed, you'll change the behavior of the group. So, mm. yes. Yeah. That reminds me of the assimilation card. Yes. 
these things are like all kind of intertwined a bit, right? Because <laughs> it's like interconnectedness. Yeah, and and actually, even if you think about it, so my positionality would affect the way the cards were made, right? <laughs> because <laughs> yes. I chose. Uh, so that's how some things end up being related, right? Because yeah, I'm putting my lens on 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 some stuff. Yeah. And, you know, coming back, you mentioned that one class may or may not be about critical race theory, but let's assume it is. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I love this prompt. And I think it's such a powerful prompt on the critical race theory card that talks about how would the design change if it was developed by someone of a different race? Yes. So that's an idea that I've been thinking about for about two years before then, I mean, I, I don't know why I never thought about it before, right? But it was about two years ago that I was in a design class and I found that I thought that the majority of students were choosing to design for white people. And I had never really noticed, I had never really thought about it before or noticed it before. And in that year, I was just trying to figure out, okay, how do we get the students to shift their perspective? How do we get their students to just consider other perspectives? And so I introduced this race card, no pun intended, right? This critical race theory card where I was asking <laughs> them, um, would the persons, would the design change, you know? And as I moved around the room, I remember listening to one student in particular kind of almost banging the table and said, no, nothing will change. And actually, I, mm. I thought about it. I'm like, okay, is this, that student right that nothing will change? And, you know, sometimes I'm asking, sometimes I have to ask myself, okay, am I just kind of like over-focusing on difference? But I do think that this difference matters. Uh, and I think that... We use products, you know, different groups might use products in different ways. And, you know, it's like, it's not even that the white designer now has designed for black people, right? Because the card kind of sends them in that direction. But it's not quite like that. It's really that the card is trying to help people see, oh, we actually should be doing wider research. We should have more diverse teams so that there are people within our team who can respond to this better. We should have people from different groups within our, uh, you know, different user groups actually within our design process so that the user groups can help us work better. You know, so it's like that race card is about getting people to see difference and not think that it doesn't exist. Because, you know, if you are from a dominant group, you sometimes don't have the sensitivity to understand the challenges of the group that is not well served. And so, you know, it could be about race, it could be about gender, it could be about accessibility. Um, it's like, the umbrella issue is the same, right? How are you going to understand how a product is not well served if you are not part of the dominant group, you know? And is, does the product serve people who are not in the dominant group well? That's, that's really what the, the question that we have to think about as designers. You know, I can't help but like point out that design is about empathy. Yeah. And if we're not willing to empathize with those that might be a little different than us and ones that we don't think in the same way, and you know, there's a spectrum. Mm -hmm. And the further someone is away from you, the harder it is to even in your mind, even if you want that empathy, you just you aren't aware of it. I've got a great example. I'd love to hear your reaction to this. Mm -hmm. I was at a conference about three years ago called Culturati, and they're actually – the well, it'll be after this airs, it will have happened, but I'm really excited because we're going to be attending again this year. And it's really focused on culture, diversity, inclusion, and how companies can show up better for their employees and create better opportunities. And the closing panel a couple of years ago included Carolyn Winga, and she's the head of diversity at Target. She was incredible. There's a hotel here in Austin called South Congress Hotel, and apparently they have rain showers 
in this hotel with no extra like handle that you can just handheld sprayer. Mm. And so she came out like, and they were talking about designing products for people. And, and she's like, you know, I'm at a hotel right now that has a racially insensitive shower. Yes. <laughs> That's immediately what I thought. <laughs> and it was pretty amazing to like, I, I was just so, A, she was like really awesome and just a firecracker. And so it was hilarious listening to her, but I was like, man, like this inanimate object is racially yes. insensitive. <laughs> like, you know, it's like, and it's just like, it's kind of a funny way to say it, but ultimately the designer didn't consider these things, right? Yeah, that's a really good example because I, I mean, sometimes I've struggled with this example, but that's a good example. Like when you immediately, as, as you talked about the rain shower, I just thought, oh, well, I wouldn't use it. <laughs> <laughs> right. And uh, yeah, I wouldn't use it because... I mean, frankly, my hair takes like three hours to dry. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I don't want, I mean, there's some showers when, yes, I want all of my hair to get wet, but there are others where, uh-uh. So yeah, I could, okay, good. You gave me an example for me to use about how the product would change. <laughs> yeah, I mean, absolutely. And the, and the thing is, even if the product doesn't change, it's not about forcing change to a product. It's about making sure we're, exercising empathy deeply yes yeah i've struggled with how people talk about empathy in this design thinking world because i think that some of it is is a bit superficial mm. and i've actually kind of focused on uh, yeah many different ways of trying to make the empathy deeper so like these cards are one one thing um the positionality wheel that i've created where which is to force people to look at positionality and talk about positionality. That's another thing. Um, when I was teaching at Tulane, students had to go out. I brought a filmmaker in class to teach students more about storytelling. And, you know, like the students had to present their interim, um, their initial empathy interviews to the to filmmaker. And the filmmaker, she was the one who said, look, you're not going deep enough. You know, you're calling this an empathy interview, but it's so transactional. It's so superficial. How are you going to evoke some emotion from me? You know, because I think that, yeah, people's empathy muscle <laughs> needs to be um, activated a little bit more. You know, I think that we could do a lot more work in design and design thinking to get that to work better. I think that's an excellent sentiment to end on. And so with that, I want to just see if you have any final thoughts or anything you want to leave our listeners with. Oh, well, I guess, you know, like the thing to leave people with is where is their exclusion in your life? You know, like how are you excluding people? And then can you design ways of, um, can you design that exclusion out? Right. So is it that you're running meetings and you've forgotten to turn on closed captioning or, you know, where are you somehow keeping people out? And it could be there could be so many different ways. And it's a muscle that we have to learn to exercise of recognizing exclusion. I, I wrote a paper with my good friend Marcelo Paiva, uh, who's a UX specialist in Miami. And we've been looking at that, you know, how can we get people to recognize exclusion and then design that exclusion out? And it's not going to happen in a short space of time, but it's a muscle that we can, we can practice and, and work much harder on. And people can reach out to me to continue the conversation. They can reach out on Twitter, on LinkedIn. Just look for me and I'll, I, I'm responsive. <laughs> Excellent. Well, it's been a pleasure having you today, Leslie Ann. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Douglas. Thanks for joining me for another episode of Control the Room. Don't forget to subscribe to receive updates when new episodes are released. And if you want more, head over to our blog where I post weekly articles and resources about working better together. VoltageControl.com